Okay, so welcome everybody um, to uh, the 101st webinar hosted by socialprotection.org. We're live from Chiang Mai, Thailand on the occasion of the annual EPRI, IDS and Maastricht University training um, taking place in, in this beautiful city. Uh, we have live audience uh, from people uh, of the region and all over the world joining us um, inside the room that are being trained um, by our experts during these two weeks. And we've taken the occasion to um, deliver a webinar on food security and nutrition sensitive social protection, looking at what, um, what is the evidence and where should we go next. Uh, these, um, it's convened by the World Food Program um, in consideration of a lot of studies that have been commissioned to um, EPRI, IDS, and uh, the University of Maastricht. So here today with me, um, I have uh, Dr. Michael Sampson uh, and Stephen Devereaux and Francisca Grassman. Uh, uh, we have uh, Stephen Devereau, who is research fellow at the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex. Um, we also have with us today uh, Professor Dr. Francisca Grassman, um, who is a professor of social protection and development at UNU Merid and the School of Governance at Maastricht University. And uh, we also have uh, Dr. Michael Sampson, who's the director and co founder of the Economic Policy and Research Institute. Um, so it is a pleasure uh, to welcome our speakers and uh, all the people that are joining us live um, to join this very interesting um, discussion on food security and nutrition sensitive. And I am Juan Gonzalo Jaramillo Mejia. I'll be your moderator today. I am a program policy officer of the United Nations World Food Program. And it's really a pleasure uh, to be with you all today. So today the uh, discussion will start with Stephen Devereaux giving us um, uh, an analytical framework uh, to understand the relation between food security and nutrition. It will later um, go into regional perspectives. We will listen from Stephen Devereaux uh, from study he was commissioned on 10 countries from the Middle East and North Africa. We will later have uh, Francisca uh, talking about Central Asia regional study um, that informed the, stra the, the strategy, the regional strategy for the World Food Program there. And we will later have Michael Sampson talking about Sub-Saharan Africa. So as you will see, we'll, we'll first cover the regional perspectives of the food security and social protection uh, linkage. And then what we would do is uh, we're going to find out which are those recommendations, uh, what are the main conclusions on the overall um, the overall considerations that we should bear in mind, and of course, what are the next avenues for research and inquiry. We will, throughout this live stream, we'll be very thankful if you can share your, uh, your questions uh, via the chat, uh, and of course, Twitter, with the hashtag of the uh, socialprotection.org. So to start, uh, I will give the floor to, to Stephen Devereaux uh, to talk about the, uh, the studies that he conducted uh, in the MENA region, and of course, the, in, in, the, in, in the MENA region, but as well, uh, the analytical framework that he has developed to be able to analyze the evidence. But before we start, I wanted to say that the Word for Program has commissioned an extensive amount of re knowledge products that you may not know they exist. They are actually in socialprotection.org and on our website that you can actually refer to, and we would be delighted for you to, to read and look at. Um, we're going to look, as you can see in the screen, we have a bunch of studies from all over the world talking about different issues of food secure and nutrition from school feeding to the first thousand days to situation analysis in different regions of the world to the role as well that the World Food Program plays in ensuring not only food security and nutrition, but risk uh, management and shock response. So 
There are a bunch of studies as well that are specific from countries like Kenya, as you will see uh, later in the webinar. So to start, uh, let me give then the floor to uh, Stephen Deverell to talk about the analytical framework. Thank you very much, Juan Gonzalo. I'm going to start by introducing us to a paradox. Some people think that food security and nutrition security are the same thing, or that one leads inevitably to the other. But actually, the evidence suggests that there is a big difference between the two, and you can't assume that if you achieve food security outcomes from a certain intervention, that you'll also achieve nutritional improvements. So what we find from many impact evaluations is that cash transfer programs in particular report positive impacts on household food security indicators. For example, expenditure on food usually rises when you give poor households cash transfers. Their meals consumed per day might rise. Dietary diversity might increase, which is a very robust indicator of food security. However, in those same interventions where we find positive food security in impacts, we find that there is very little impact on nutritional status. So, for example, if you measure child stunting rates or child wasting or adult BMI, you might find no impact on those outcomes at all, even though you've achieved positive impacts on food security. So the question is, why? As, as an example, here's a evaluation that was done of the social cash transfer pilot program in Tigray, Ethiopia. Here, cash transfers were given to poor households, and the evaluation found significant increases on household spending on food. The annual food gap in those households fell by half a month. Adults and children ate more meals, dietary quantity improved, diet quality improved, and seasonal fluctuations in food consumption were smoothed by having these cash transfers. But if you look at the graph on the right-hand side, you'll see that nutrition status did not improve at all. So in seven rounds of monitoring of child stunting, there was actually no change over two years. It remained more or less the same. How do we explain this paradox that food security apparently can be improved with social protection programs, but nutrition status doesn't? A very useful way of looking at this issue is UNICEF's conceptual framework for the causes of child malnutrition. So here is the full diagram. What we're going to do is focus on the top half, which is the areas where social protection can intervene quite effectively. So here you can see that malnutrition is the outcome that we're interested in, and it's driven by two factors, inadequate dietary intake and also by disease. And those in turn are driven by three sets of factors, inadequate access to food, inadequate care for children and women, and insufficient health services and unhealthy environment. Now, if you, if you try to intervene through social protection programs, what you're normally doing is in, impacting on the inadequate access to food problem by providing people with cash, which they can then use to buy food. So the poverty route is inadequate dietary intake is reduced, so dietary intake improves, and that should lead to improved uh, nutrition outcomes. But of course, in reality, Malnutrition is not driven only by access to food or by poverty. It's also driven by factors totally unrelated to cash transfers. For example, if mothers don't exclusively breastfeed for the first six months, or if there's poor hygiene practices, or the water that people are drinking is unsafe and there's no sanitation. A child, for example, can be eating plenty of food, but if it has diarrhea, then the food, the nutrients go straight out and there's no nutritional benefits. So, the answer to the paradox is that social protection improves food security by improving access to food. And that you can see by the left-hand side of the diagram, cash transfers improve access to food, and that improves food security, which we understand as access to sufficient food. But social protection does not necessarily improve nutrition security. And the reason for that is because social protection doesn't necessarily address the other pathways. For instance, if you invest in women's education and girls' education, you might get better care for children, breastfeeding, nutrition might improve, for example, through nutrition, behavior change, communication. And also, if the government invests in adequate health services, in hygiene, in clean water supplies, in providing adequate sanitation, then you can reduce the disease driver of food insecurity and nutrition insecurity. So in other words, to achieve food and nutrition security, you need not only to increase access to food, you also need to 
provide people with the capacity to avoid malnutrition, which comes from health hygiene and care practices. So now we will talk about the, the Middle East and North Africa. So let's start looking at country and regional case studies. This is a 10 country research study that was commissioned from IDS by the World Food Programme a few years ago, back in 2015. And the objectives of the study were to look at social protection and safety net practices in those countries from a particular perspective of food security and nutrition. Also focusing on refugees and internally displaced persons, looking also at the contribution of informal safety nets, and then to analyze gaps in national social protection and safety net systems and draw out implications for WFP programming. So if we start with the context, the countries in this region are suffering from various challenges. Economic growth is very low, unemployment is very high, labor force participation is very low. We're also looking at a range of countries. We shouldn't generalize across all of these countries. Some, con some countries are quite high income, Lebanon, Iran, Libya, others are middle income like Tunisia, Iraq, Egypt and Jordan. And then we have the low income countries in this group of 10, which are Palestine, Sudan and Yemen. The political context is also extremely challenging. All, almost all of these countries have faced severe disruptions. Uh, the Arab Spring, governments being overthrown, the division of Sudan into, into South Sudan, the ongoing insecurity in Iraq and Palestine, the influx of Syrian refugees into Lebanon and other countries in the region. So all of these have created a great amount of turmoil and it's very difficult when you think about what political instability does, it's difficult to achieve food security in a context where livelihoods are disrupted, markets are disrupted, production is disrupted and trade is disrupted. And this combination of economic, political, and also environmental challenges leads to severe food security and nutrition challenges. So MENA is the world's largest net importer of cereals. About half of calories consumed derive from imports. There's a very small agricultural sector, but a large proportion of rural livelihoods depend on agriculture and pastoralism and agro-pastoralism. With climate change, uh, the region which is already subject to natural disasters is facing more and more droughts and more and more unstable yields. And this dependency on cereal imports was heightened during the global triple F crisis, the food, fuel and financial crisis of 2008, when food prices spiked. And at the same time, as food prices rose, so did the rates of malnutrition in the MENA region. So this shows you the, the dangers of depending on, on cereal, on food imports. Now, if you look at the food security status in the region, we find that if you look at Northern Africa and Western Asia in this map, Rates of child stunting are fairly high. They're below 20%, which is the threshold for high, but still they're pretty high. They're not as high as elf elsewhere in Africa, but they are considerably higher than they should be given the level of income in these countries, in most of these countries. Now, what's interesting is looking beyond stunting or underweight to looking at overweight or obesity. And here you look at North Africa and Western Asia, and you'll see that actually the rates of overweight children in those regions, in the MENA region, is considerably higher than anywhere else in Africa except Southern Africa, and also higher than most other regions of the world. So this highlights an issue which isn't sufficiently appreciated in this area of food security and nutrition, which is that we need to look very closely at problems of overweight and obesity and not just at underweight and inadequate access to food. When we look at what's being done around social protection in the region, what are the main interventions, what are the limitations, what are the opportunities? Historically, this region has been characterized by a high dependence on consumer food price subsidies. And in fact, if you look at the graph, you'll see that the blue uh, bars show you the proportion of social protection spending that um, is derived, is allocated to food and fuel subsidies. And a very small proportion on the top of those bars, the brown bits is devoted to social safety nets, which are not subsidies. So the balance has very much been skewed historically towards subsidies. Now, the problem with subsidies, in theory, everybody gets access to subsidies so because they're universal. The problem is that they are inefficient, they have high leakages to the non-poor, and therefore they are regressive because the non-poor spend more on food and fuel than the poor do. And you could, in theory, take that subsidy and allocate it more efficiently by targeting it towards the poor who need it. 
much more than the rich do. So following a lot of pressure, especially from the international financial institutions like the World Bank and the IMF, subsidies are being phased out in most of those countries in the region. The problem with this is that phasing out subsidies obviously pushes up food prices and it threatens food security unless you introduce compensatory measures and to that, for that you can use what's called the subsidy dividend. In other words, the money that you save on subsidies can now be reallocated to cash transfers. So let's say you have $100 million that you're spending on subsidies. If you take that $100 million and target it to the poorest 20%, then each of the poor should get five times as much as they were getting through the subsidy. Of course, it's not that simple. What we find is that firstly, there are higher administrative costs with targeting and with running cash transfer programs and with general subsidies, but also the subsidy is hardly ever allocated 100% to cash transfers. So um, for whatever reasons, maybe political economy reasons, governments tend not to spend as much on targeted cash transfers to the poor as they were doing on general subsidies. And that means that the poor could even be left worse off because if there's no program or they're not well targeted and they're not reached by those subsidies, then they could end up, end up facing higher food prices with no protection. As we've shifted towards cash transfers, which is happening, we are seeing at the moment still relatively low impact. And the reasons for that are coverage is still very low. Um, only about 16% of the poorest quintile has access to cash transfers or social assistance. The benefit level is very low. People aren't getting very much money and the targeting is very inefficient. There are of course many other interventions which are found in the region and also around the world. So popular social protection instruments that, are, that you find in MENA include school feeding and public works. And school feeding, there are some targeted interventions in the, in the region. For example, some programs target girls specifically to try and redress gender imbalances in education access in Iran and Yemen, that's, uh, that's been tried. There are also fortified foods being used in school meals to try and address micronutrient deficiencies in some countries, including Egypt. Also in Egypt, Food for Education is trying to incentivize child laborers to return to school. So giving an incentive for kids who are working to come back, to come to school. And finally, we have local purchases for homegrown school feeding programs, which tries to stimulate local agricultural production, and that's been done in Sudan. Public works projects, which is providing temporary employment on community work programs, can have beneficial impacts. It can reduce seasonal food insecurity, for example, if it's well-timed. It can stabilize income and consumption after shocks. It can also build resilience. It can contribute to climate change adaptation. For a good example of this is the program in Sudan called Safe Access to Firewood and Alternative Energy, which transfers fuel-efficient stoves uh, to poor households. And finally, we have nutrition programs in the region. And there are many of these. They include targeted or blanket interventions to treat chronic and acute undernutrition, vitamin A and iron supplements, salt iodization, fortification, and specialized foods. And these are very important because hunger, food insecurity isn't only about not enough food, it's also about uh, unbalanced diets, which, for example, includes not enough vitamins and minerals. So these kind of interventions can uh, protect people against health risks, such as anemia, that arise from micronutrient deficiencies. So, what should be done? Our study concluded that there are many areas where social protection programming can be improved, can be strengthened. The first is that coverage needs to be significantly expanded. Very small numbers of the poor receive any social assistance. And that implies that when you have a large subsidy program, there is a huge subsidy dividend that must be captured and invested in substantial expansion of social assistance program. Targeting must be improved. There are both high inclusion and high exclusion errors. Malnutrition should be prioritized in all social protection programming because as we've seen, undernutrition, overnutrition and micronutrient deficiencies are a serious problem in the region. And we should be targeting pregnant and lactating women and also children during the first 1000 days. A particular focus might be also implied for urban food insecurity. Very often social protection starts in rural areas and doesn't really spread to the towns and cities, but we have higher urbanization rates and high levels of youth unemployment in the MENA region. So we should think about how we can strengthen labor market linkages through social protection, not only through public works, but that's one mechanism. Because the region is subject to natural disasters and shocks, resilience building is very important. So for instance, contingency financing for surge capacity so that programs can be scaled up rapidly during food crises. And this will be able to, this will help us in linking short-term safety nets and humanitarian responses to longer-term social protection. 
And finally, I think this is a common finding across the world actually, coordination should be strengthened between food security and social protection programs. And that we argue that food and nutrition security should be a priority of all national social protection policies. The, the microphone? So, couple years. Okay, let's move to a different region and let's go to Central Asia. Now, at Maastricht University, WFP has commissioned us to do three country case studies about two or three years ago in Central Asia, and we covered Armenia, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan. And based on these country studies, we also produced a regional synthesis report. For all these reports also, let's say the executive summaries have been separately published in case you're interested to see, uh, let's say, a reduced, a smaller version. Now, what were the objective of the social of these uh, reports? First of all, it was to provide or to give an overview of existing social protection and safety nets in these three Central Asian countries particularly with a focus on food and nutrition security objectives and outcome, because obviously in these countries, previously social protection reviews have been implemented, but they rarely looked specifically at food and nutrition security objectives. Another objective was to let... Please. So to look at the to contribute to development of a WFP social protection strategy for the region. So given that other donors are already in the field, the idea was to see, to get an overview, where are gaps and where would actually WFP has, let's say, a strategic advantage to work together with others in the country. Now, if you look at the food, main food and security nutrition challenges in the region, if you look on your right side, at least it is on my right side, I have two graphs. On the first one, we look at the percentage of the population which is undernourished. And you see this, I mean, Tajikistan clearly stands out among the countries included. And Tajikistan is the poorest country in the region and in Central Asia in particular. In all other countries, let's say, undernutrition is relatively moderate. Now, in the graph below, we only look at children and the percentage of children under five that are either wasted, stunted, or underweight. And again, that's similar to many other countries in the world. You see that stunting is still a considerable problem, particularly in Tajikistan, Azerbaijan, Kyrgyzstan, and Armenia. On the other hand, in Kazakhstan and Georgia, for example, we, the wasting is a larger problem than stunting. On the other hand, as we have just seen in Stephen Devereaux's slide on overnutrition, in these countries we can really talk about this double burden of over and undernutrition. I wrote down the number. So in Central Asia, it is 10.7% of the children which are actually overweight or even obese. So in the future, that can turn into a major food security or a nutritional problem. Now, what is the reason for this food security and nutritional challenge? Obviously, poverty rates are still high in the countries. On the other hand, there is a lack of nutritional awareness about what would be balanced, a healthy diet. And also that most of these countries heavily depend on food imports. So as already mentioned by Stephen before, in the context of the MENA region, the triple F crisis in 2008 had also a devastating impact on the Central Asian countries. And that contributes to food insecurity and malnutrition in these countries. Moreover, given the location of these countries, also particularly think, for example, also Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, they are very vulnerable to covariant shocks natural disaster, landslides, floods, but also given that they are so dependent on imports, global economic developments also translate into triple into the countries. And so food and energy prices are very volatile and move along with the global, uh, with the global level. 
contrary to many other countries, what you see here is these countries have rather well-developed social protection systems. They have inherited a lot from the former Soviet Union. Social insurance is very important. While on the other hand, social assistance, we have cash transfers. Most countries have school feeding programs. Social services are there. I don't talk about the quality of all these programs, but at least the institutions are there. And most countries also have active labor market, um, labor market policies. And I do not want to forget to mention the informal social protection in terms of remittances is particularly important in countries like Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. So there are comprehensive social protection systems, at least theoretically in place, and social insurance in particular, old age pensions are very important for poverty reduction. And I also use most of the budget which is allocated to social protection. But if we talk about social assistance in all these countries, what we see that coverage with social assistance, non-contributory cash transfer is very low and the value of the benefits is low as well. So as a result, you see hardly any poverty reduction impact due to social assistance transfers. What is missing maybe are what we call shock responsive safety nets. And there is also what we see this promotive function or this productive safety net idea is something which has not yet been translated into these countries. They are now piloting with some cash plus in it initiatives. The World Food Program has been working with some cash for asset program. There are initiatives, but they are not at the broad scale as all the other programs. Now, what are our main conclusions and findings from these three country studies? As I have just mentioned, so these productive safety net approaches are still underdeveloped uh, in, the central, in the Central Asia regions. While all the countries do have active labor market policies, again, at least, at least uh, on paper, for example, in Kyrgyzstan, you would see that uh, for social assistance beneficiaries, they have no access to the active labor market policies because this is also on the one hand, we have the Minister of Labor. I mean, we have a Minister of Labor and Social Development, but within that minister, ministry, the Labor Department is responsible for active labor market policies. And let's say the social development part is responsible for social assistance and social insurance. However, there is no link between these two as such. So instead of maybe develop new productive safety nets, another alternative would be to open and broaden active, the active labor market policies to other parts of the population. School feeding programs, as in many other parts of the world, are very important elements of the social protection strategies in these countries. And there, I think we have seen uh, also quite some development as we have been moving from a, a bun and tea meal to much more uh, comprehensive school meals. And that is also not the least to um, interventions which were supported by WFP. We have the movement to homegrown school meals, for example, which would actually which includes the local community and the parents in preparing uh, um, the meals, but also in uh, um, procuring the food from the local area. And these avenues are very promising. However, so comprehensive social safety nets are required in the region also to break this, in a way, vicious cycle of hunger and poverty. And with respect to the existing social protection programs, it is important to increase the coverage and the adequacy of the current systems. What could also be strengthened is that the monitoring and evaluation systems could be strengthened as well in order to generate more knowledge and more evidence of existing programs. If we look at these four dimensions of food security, we also found that in this region, social protection has the greatest potential to improve and help households to get access to food. Now, I will also shortly talk about Sub-Saharan Africa, one country, Kenya, before I move, give the floor to Michael Sampson. On behalf of WFP and also UNICEF, we have been doing a country case study in Kenya. 
And I have to say, this is rather new. We have had a validation uh, workshop uh, just before the summer, and we will the study, the report will be published hopefully before the end of the year. So there will be another dissemination workshop hopefully soon uh, in Kenya, and then we will be able to share the report with you. So what you see here is in a, as such brand new. And the objective of this, pro of this project was rather broad. It was not necessarily focused on looking at food security and nutrition and channel challenges. Rather, it was to develop a kind of an investment case which can support the Kenyan model and it would also which would make the case for linking, let's say, the national safety net programs to other social services, livelihood and labor market uh, um, activities. Now, if we look at a country like Kenya, you see on this picture behind this woman, it is that this is a very challenging uh, um, vegetation, at least in some areas of Kenya. Kenya has areas which are um, very, um, how to call it, arid and semi-arid areas with very little rainfall and it's challenging to generate actually a sufficient agricultural outputs, produce. But you also see poverty rates in Kenya are still relatively high with 42% of the population which is actually less than the international extreme poverty line. And in these arid northern regions, for example, poverty rates can go up to, let's say, four out of five people, which is incredibly high. Looking at the children, again, stunting is a serious issue. One fourth of the children under the age of five in Kenya are stunted. But surprisingly, the country also is prone to natural disasters. On the one hand, we have droughts, and on the other hand, floods. And so food, with respect to food security, we see that the challenges are particularly high in the northeastern provinces, but also along the coast and the Rift Valley. Now, over the last couple of years, Kenya has made huge progress with respect to their social protection system, and they have invested quite a lot. So now you can say we have a national social safety net program which consists of four distinctive social assistance cash transfer program, which are targeted at different groups, also going over the life cycle, which is would see in the diagram on the right hand side. So we have cash transfers for orphans and vulnerable children. We have cash transfers for persons with disabilities and the transfer for um, elderly persons. And finally, we have the hunger and safety net program, although this is only in for countries in the in arid and semi-arid areas. Now, these programs are also supplemented within kind transfers, school feeding programs, and some asset creating programs. And you also need to know these are national programs, but every country, county in Kenya in addition, has their own programs, but we only looked at those which are at the national level. Unfortunately, what we also see is that, that the impact of this transfer is rather limited. And again, it is the low benefit value which limits its adequacy. And there are also some issues with implementation. Now, what we have learned is that the effects of these national programs can be enhanced with an improved design and implementation. And it's also that we can combine transfers with other social policies, such as cash plus program to address specific barriers. What we have there is country, let's say, we have looked at four specific cash plus programs. One is, so uh, two of these programs are targeted at the uh, mothers, pregnant women with infants. We have the CUP Youth Employment Project in Kisumu, which was looking at the um, training programs uh, for the youth. And we also looked at asset creation program, which are currently implemented in 16 of these arid and semi-arid uh, regions. Now, the main conclusions and findings. And I only focus here on very specific findings which are related to um, food security. 
we did some analysis and what we found out is actually let's say that the impact the average impact of cash transfers masks or let's say conceals important differences across households and it really the, the, the impact of the transfer can differ considerably at where the household actually stands if you look at this upper left graph what we looked at what is let's say says something about the uh, um uh, how do you say how well the soil is it is looks at the vegetation index huh? and if it is under 20 that would means it's very poor soil well if, if you go to the right hand side it is a, a very richer soil and we looked at this um it's an impact assessment what we have done and what you see is that the benefits in this case the hsmp program was had the largest impact on food expenditures in those households which have been hit by droughts or households which from the very beginning had low food expenditures. So this points at very strong safeguarding potential of the cash transfers. We also see that the cash transfers from the national safety net programs can have positive effect on households human capital development and the livelihood. But again, it matters the context in within which the household lives. How far away from a market is the household, for example? Or also, where did they start from? We can also see, for example, then that by using additional services, that the impact of the cash transfer can actually be magnified and it can actually reduce some of the barriers that we have found. Now we give the, the floor to Michael Sampson, who will talk about Sub-Saharan Africa and three studies that have been commissioned by wfp 2 efri Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Juan Gonzalo. And let me first thank the 112 participants who are connected globally to this webinar and the 27 participants here in the room with us from EFRI's 25th global course in designing and implementing social protection systems. Over the next 12 minutes, I want to talk about three very different studies, but studies that nonetheless resonate with each other, but perhaps more importantly, with the excellent studies we've just heard from Stephen and from Francisca. Um, as the slide changes somewhat slowly, uh, um, the objectives of the first study were to focus on the first thousand days and how can social help contribute to food security and nutritional outcomes. Yes, can I look at my camera? I will, but I'd like to interact with the entire audience, so thank you. Um, so we're looking at what these interventions are and what the best practices are, and we asked one main question. How can better social protection programs interact with food security and nutrition to tackle the major challenges that keep pregnant women and young children from food security outcomes. So next slide here talks about some of these challenges. First of all, many of these programs do not have nutrition as an objective in the program. And it raises this question, should food security and nutrition impacts be an important objective for social protection? And as a result of this gap, Many of these programs don't have adequate linkages to the complementary interventions required to achieve impact. And third, not surprisingly, targeting is a major headache in effective design and implementation. In some of the countries, most of the nutritionally most vulnerable are not poor. And so poverty targeting excludes them. And Fourth, there's a contextual challenge. We want to get some common findings, some common mechanisms that can work regionally, but they have to address the requirements for being appropriate for each individual country. The next slide talks a little bit about the results within this graphical framework. We found 10 issues. 10 deprivations, 10 major gaps that interact with malnutrition and stunting and wasting are in turn reinforced by that. Income poverty, 
health and nutrition gaps, water and sanitation gaps, limited access to livelihoods and income generating activities, educational challenges, the prevalence of shocks, particularly climate shocks, women's social status, vitally important, access to healthcare, food and nutrition deficits, and particularly infant and young child care practices. There's a complex interaction here driving the problem. And there are three things that we worked on to identify as potential interventions. First of all, and a relatively simple thing in theory, but a really contentious one in practice, can we ensure that nutritional outcomes are incorporated in the objectives of social protection programs? I'm sure we'll have a debate right here in a few minutes about that very question. Second, then once we get to that point, can we make these programs more nutrition sensitive? And then third, and I think most importantly, and echoing a theme that Stephen has highlighted, that Francisca has highlighted, that I think we'll all agree on, we need to link nutrition programs and social protection programs better. And not just nutrition programs and social protection programs. But if you look at that green bar across the top, we need multi-sectoral interventions to work better in health, in education, in gender, in economic development, in agriculture, in water and sanitation, and in more. And if we can do this, we can improve resilience, we can decrease poverty, we can empower women, we can get better food security and nutrition outcomes, we can decrease malnutrition. And why is that so important now to policymakers across Africa and around the world? Because this is building the human capital and particularly the cognitive capital that drives economic growth and development. The next slide here talks about some of the key findings. One, we wanna focus on nutrition sensitivity, not nutrition specificity, because specific nutrition programs generate limited impacts and maybe one, as I'll after this, we'll talk about some of that, that really interesting point you made about this at our last course. The key point Stephen just made, food security is not the same thing as nutrition insecurity. We need to make clear that improving nutritional outcomes require much more complex processes. The value of the cash transfer matters. Most of the programs we looked at, they're a good start, but they're not adequate to generate the required impacts. And yes, there's a tough trade-off between generosity and coverage when resources are limited. But when we have good evidence that demonstrates these impacts, we can thread that needle. But most importantly, coming out of this study, complementarity is essential. A recurrent theme from Francisca, from Stephen, and from all the work we've looked at we need more integrated and comprehensive approaches to achieve impact. The second study resonates with what Francisca just discussed. The case studies had similar objectives, similar methodologies, and not surprisingly, in spite of the different country context, similar results. We're looking at nutrition sensitive social protection programs in five African countries to produce a report. And on the next slide, we talk about some of the key challenges in getting there. Um, like in the other regions, there are serious food security and nutrition deficits driven in large part by overlapping deprivations in terms of monetary poverty, poor health, nutritional behaviors, food insecurity, water and sanitation challenges, and the existing initiatives are too limited, not only in terms of donor support, but in terms of government co-financing. Getting government on board to scale up these programs is a major challenge all across the continent. The next slide here talks a little bit, which is already here, um, talks about some of the evidence we see from specific countries. And none of the countries have invested adequately or effectively enough to achieve the key nutritional outcomes that we're talking about here. Ethiopia has perhaps the world's grandest exercise in climate change adaptation through the Productive Safety Net Program. And it's been remarkably successful in promoting food security. But the results on nutrition 
are not as satisfying. Kenya has innovated a hunger safety net program that helps to bridge the humanitarian development nexus, a model for many countries to look at, but it still faces challenges. And again, while it works well in promoting food security, getting some nutrition impacts proves a lot more challenging. The Gambia, Mozambique, Zambia, they have programs, but not at the adequate scale to achieve the required impacts. When we look at the conclusions here from this study, we need a more comprehensive social protection approach that focuses on integrating all the key interventions. There's a new math here. We have at least eight things in terms of health and education, water and sanitation, specific nutritional programs, livelihoods, food security. All of these things must work together as complex gears. And eight minus one equals eight minus one, zero. If one of those gears is missing, we don't get to impact. We need a comprehensive social protection framework integrated across the sectors to achieve these impacts. The case studies highlight the opportunities to increase these synergies and identify roles for integrated delivery systems like management information systems and payment mechanisms that can not only deliver the benefits effectively, but also contribute developmentally through providing households with information, with communications and with financial services. And a major gap the study identified there is not enough regional evidence integrated within a South-South evidence building framework. That's the low hanging fruit. That is one way where we can start learning. And this webinar is a start to building that kind of knowledge base and global collaboration. The next study is with the World Food Program's Center of Excellence and takes a specific look at school feeding programs. And this is important because Francisca highlighted those as very promising opportunities in the regions she studied. And they provide an example of complex programming. And I'm just looking at how much time I have left, 23, 10, just five minutes. Right on track, right? Good, thank you. Four questions we asked. What programs exist in Africa? What are their impacts? What drives these impacts? And the all important question, what can we do better? The next slide there talks about some of the challenges. Ping, let's get it here. Yes, almost all the programs target primary school students and yet the real opportunity to intervene nutritionally is in the first thousand days. But when we go to preschool and early childhood centers, the take up of these services is too limited. So school feeding on its own cannot solve this problem. It's an example of the major lesson here. We need to integrate interventions together. We need to ensure children have access to these services so that school feeding programs can come in and be optimally effective. Most of these programs use geographical targeting. Why? Because there is not enough funding to make them nationally universal. And as a result, they suffer from high errors of exclusion. And who's implementing these programs? Almost everywhere, education ministries, which is great to have the education ministries on board. And that helps with food security, but we need more cooperation and collaboration across ministries to get the nutritional outcomes. The next slide there talks about some of the key results. And first of all, that very green Africa tells us school feeding is everywhere. None of it necessary scale, but in almost every country. And complementary interventions of some sorts are present in nearly all the school feeding programs, like deworming and micronutrient fortification and training programs. National school feeding policies exist, and they're in the process of being adopted in the vast majority of African Union countries. They need to be resourced. We see community involvement being very important and evaluation frameworks, not surprisingly, mostly focus on educational outcomes and to some extent on health outcomes. The most exciting dimension of school feeding, I'm gonna talk about for a few more minutes, homegrown school feeding 
offers an opportunity to integrate education, health, nutritional awareness, livelihoods, agricultural development into a complex program. The next slide here gives us some of our conclusions. We see positive impacts on education, on health, and Cote d'Ivoire. We see important developmental interventions promoting agricultural development, which have led to increases in agricultural productivity. We see in Kenya school feeding programs fostering community empowerment. In South Africa, we see homegrown school feeding programs contributing not only to reducing poverty and improving education, but also supporting local economic development. But the most important result from this study is that our current way of evaluating school feeding programs is simply too limited to provide a proper valuation of these programs. We need to understand how school feeding generates a comprehensive portfolio of outcomes. We need to be able to measure the impacts of school feeding as they are enablers of intersectoral outcomes. School feeding is not just about meals in schools. Yes, it is partly that, and as a result, generates educational impacts. But nutrition, as a result, is more complicated. We need to be intervening in the first thousand days. So what does a primary school or secondary school feeding program do for nutrition? Well, one, it takes advantage of that second window of opportunity to remediate early childhood deprivation if the programs are high quality and delivered to adolescent girls between 11 and 13, but within the whole context, but you must be reaching that group with high protein, high quality school feeding programs. Boys start that second window a little bit later. We need home gardens. We need to be structuring the demand school feeding programs offer to stabilize rural development initiatives to supply that school feeding demand. We need to use home gardens to promote nutritional awareness. We need to promote take home rations in order to reach children who are not able to participate in the school feeding. This lesson from school feeding resonates across all the studies we're talking about here. Policymakers generally do not appreciate how important social protection's role is in achieving nutritional outcomes, not just because social protection benefits are spent on food, not just because social protection is a vital gear in this process, but most importantly, because social protection makes all the other gears work better. Social protection, one of the most common results we see from evaluations, promotes access to education. When a mother goes to a clinic with her baby with diarrhea and government success here, the clinic's been built, the doctor is in, and the doctor appropriately diagnoses the diarrhea that will kill that baby within a few days. And when she goes to the medicine cabinet to get the rehydration salts, the cabinet is bare. What benefit does the mother have from the successful government health intervention? She now knows exactly what will kill her baby. Oh, but she just received her social protection child support grant. She has the 17 cents equivalent in local currency. She can go down the street to the pharmacy where she can make her social protection program make markets work better for the poor. She can buy those rehydration salts and increase the effectiveness of the government's investment in health. And by the way, save her baby's life. Social protection is an entry point for behavioral change, for water, for sanitation, for maternal care practices. Social protection is a public super good that enables other public goods to work both better and to work better together. Thank you.
should I? I'm too enthused. Okay. Bye. So thank you so much for uh, for your presentations. They're very they've been quite interesting to see contrasts uh, between regions and of course uh, similarities. So what we want to do in this section very briefly, so we open the door um, to questions that are coming from all over the world. In fact, we've just had um, a very interesting hello from Peter Apollo from Nuba Mountains region in Sudan. We have people from all over uh, watching us. Um, and we say hello back, and also from Tutia Palermo, who has just uh, posed a very interesting question related to what is going to come here. And it is, what are the challenges, the overall challenges that we can um, sort of identify out of the regions in an in inductive sort of um, approach here? And where should we go next? Uh, what are the new avenues of research and inquiry uh, taking, of course, uh, you know, stock from the evidence that has been widely generated um, by the Wordford program. So let's look. Um, I would like to give the floor to Stephen so you can kind of sum up all these global and overall challenges that we see in this linkage between food security and nutrition with social protection. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Juan Gonzalo. As you know, we had a great brainstorming session among the four of us, looking for similarities and differences across our various studies and the regions that we've been looking at. And we came up with a few common themes, and I think that these sum up uh, at least some of the challenges and the ideas about where to go next. Firstly, we do understand and we know very well that social protection can achieve food security improvements. Definitely, that's not an issue. That's not even a question anymore. Household food security improves when social protection programs expand. But we're still not entirely sure about why we aren't getting those nutritional outcomes that we would expect to get with improved food security. We know in theory that it's got to do with linkages to other sectors, but in each particular context, why is a particular program not generating the nutritional outcomes that we want? What else do households need apart from, for instance, cash transfers or public works programs. A second issue is that many of the countries that we've looked at are driven by instruments. They introduce social protection on an instrument basis, meaning that they push for cash transfers or they introduce school feeding programs or public works. But that doesn't mean that they're going to necessarily maximize the impact on nutritional outcomes. So we assume that a cash transfer is going to improve nutrition status, but in reality, that doesn't happen because something else is missing. If you take a focus on trying to reduce hunger and malnutrition, like the Zero Hunger Program in Brazil, for example, then you won't start from the instrument, you'll start from the outcome or the objective that you're trying to achieve and find the best way to get there. The third point, which is a really important one, I think we found, we saw this from Francisco's presentation on Central Asia as well, that there's an increasing problem with overweight and obesity, and there's an ongoing problem with micronutrient deficiencies, for example, iron deficient um, in anemia, and that these problems are not getting enough attention because we focus very much on child stunting, especially child malnutrition, but particularly child stunting as our main indicator of malnutrition. If we don't, have, uh, if we don't pay attention to those other dimensions of food insecurity and malnutrition, we're going to miss out important aspects of what we're trying to achieve. Next point is that social protection policies in most countries are still fragmented. They're often not very well coordinated. Even within social protection, you'll find that a particular program gets the focus of one ministry. For example, public works programs might be run by the Ministry of Agriculture, whereas child grants might be run by the Ministry of Health or Department of Social Development. Pensions are run by Social Security. Often these siloized programs don't really add up to a comprehensive system. Um, within, so within the government's policies overall and even within social protection, we find a very siloized approach, which is very damaging to achieving coordinated impacts and synergies. Next point is that the design and implementation of social protection is often generic. For example, in many countries, you see a combination of public works for people that can work, plus direct support or cash transfers for people who can't work. We need to design programs that reflect the, the specific context and the needs of poor and vulnerable groups, not just a blueprint that we're rolling out all over the place as though it's going to achieve the same impacts in every different context. Second last point, I think Francisca again made this point very well, coverage of social protection and adequacy of social protection. These are two different things and both of them are challenges. Coverage means reaching all the people who need to have social assistance and we're not reaching even half. The latest estimate that I know of is about 46% of the world's population are covered by some form of social protection. 
Adequacy refers to the benefit levels. If you don't increase the amount of support that people get, you'll get very limited impacts. Limited transfers equals limited impacts. And the last point we've summarized as poor attitude towards the poor translates into poor policies. What does this mean? It means that often the poor are stigmatized as being responsible for their own poverty. You know, they're lazy, they drink the money away, they get dependent on social transfers if you give them free cash. And this leads to resistance or reluctance to give um, poor people their rights to social protection. And a poor attitude to the poor who are already marginalized and politically weak means that you won't get very well designed policies, there won't be much budget allocated to those programs, and the risks are that social protection will not achieve the food security and nutritional impacts that we're trying to achieve. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Stephen, for that for that um, conclusion on on what are the overall challenges. Now we want uh, to talk about what can we do uh, based on the evidence to promote uh, better synergy between food security and nutrition. What can policymakers and practitioners watching us and hearing the audience can can bear in mind when designing um, their their, their programs. And I will give the floor to, to Francisca, who's bringing us two very interesting diagrams from her latest research in Kenya. So I'll give you the floor, Francisca. Thank you, Juan Gonzalo. And I hope that we maybe get some inspiration about possible answers, which also will lead to policy recommendations. And it's a kind of a quick question. Why don't we see the expected outcomes, although we do all these investments uh, in social protection programs? If you look at this, this, obviously, the context matters to a large extent. But if you think about a cash transfer goes into a household, a household uses the money, wants to spend it on food or health, education, whatsoever, eventually increasing the productivity of this household which in our terms will also, let's say, generate returns on the investments that are made on cash transfers. However, on the way from the household to spending, utilizing uh, uh, the support, there are a lot of barriers, yes? And these barriers can on the one hand be related to the design of the transfer in terms of benefit value, for example, or where you have to go to get your transfer. You have to long queues on payment days costly application process and so on. It can be within the household, that is lack of knowledge, for example, how to feed properly an infant, for example, or in Kenya we also found, although there would be clinics and there are programs and there is the cash there to go to the clinic, some men don't want their wife to go to the clinic, for example. So there are different reasons within the household or then people are labor constrained. How can you participate in a public work program if you have to take care of the children? So these are barriers within the household. And then we have wider, let's say, barriers outside the household, which also play a role. For example, think of lack of infrastructure. So if you, even if you have surplus output on your farm, if you live far away from any market where you, where you can sell your produce, so you will not be able to improve your life needs, let's say. So that brings me to the next uh, uh, slide and the next diagram where we have tried to put this together in a theory of change of what needs to be done or how we can actually improve on our outcomes. So in an ideal situation, let's say the diagram goes from the left to the right and it is a straight green line. So we get the cash transfers into the household, household utilizes it will translate it into whatever productive investment and that will re um, uh, result in increased well-being of the household. However, we have the barriers on the one hand, design implementation related barriers. Clearly, the answer would be improve the design. For example, in Kenya, what you would see is that in the National Cash Transfer Program, most of these you can have only one beneficiary per household. So if you're a large household, your transfer, which is already not very big, is really thinned out if it has to be spread over, I don't know, eight household members, six household members, and then also not even talking about all the access and utilization costs. And then within the household, we have other barriers, uh, household and individual level barriers, we have environmental barriers. And there is where, for example, 
additional services, cash plus activities can come in and can play an important role. Think, for example, about some pop-up transfers in order to facilitate or pay for the transport from the household to the clinic uh, to monitor the child. Um, Yes, so <laughs> I just lost my thread. Not really a problem. Think in terms of the uh, of the wider environmental barriers that there needs also be investments outside of social protection. And I know there is always fighting over government resources. There is never enough money to do everything. But it's really, if we look at investment in social protection, what we have or what I've really learned about this over the last couple of years through the research that we have been doing you can strengthen what you can achieve with your social protection programs by investing in other sectors as well. For example, in our study in Uganda, what we have seen is, you know, people would be very happily use their mobile phones, for example, and that would actually be very beneficial for them. And there is not only the beneficiaries would use it, but also the retailers, you know, people sell uh, that you can go and, and charge your uh, a mobile phone and things like that. But it's useless if there is no mobile network coverage. So if there are no roads to go to the market. And so these other investments, like with water and sanitation, you cannot solve that, that as we have seen in the framework, you cannot solve the nutritional program just by providing food. There needs to be also safe water, for example. So one kind of investment would go into this direction. So these barriers, which are let's say, at the program level, at the household level, and in a wider context, limit the effectiveness of the social protection programs that we see. And so that is also, we need to address the different barriers. This is why context, mat context matters and actually does not always allow households to utilize the support in the most effective and beneficial way. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank, thank you, you for, for that. that. Very, very, very interesting, interesting diagram. Sure. Now, I would like to give uh, the floor to Michael so we very quickly uh, discuss what are the seven recommendations for the nutrition sensitive social protection. Uh, what can we do? So, the, the floor. Um, I'm so sorry, Michael, you're muted. We can't hear you. You can please unmute. And here's where it gets more complicated. We need to make sure our social protection systems support other sectoral interventions that achieve what Francisca has highlighted, what Stephen has highlighted, the complexity of achieving nutritional outcomes. We need to enhance cross-sectoral cooperation in order to implement these programs more effectively. And we can also integrate social protection better into the humanitarian development nexus to build linkages between social protection and humanitarian response. Okay, thank you so much. Um, you were muted, so don't un <laughs> mute yourself. Okay. I've fixed Hopefully it. Hopefully, I've been loud enough to be heard. Yeah, you were. Thank so you. now um, we're going to just leave this microphone here because I've prepared um, with you uh, some questions, and we've received very interesting questions as well for the audience. Um, so there are three questions uh, we found. And it's why do we need a food security and nutritional lens uh, to social protection and social protection? Why, why, why is that? What is the case that we need to make there? Uh, because sometimes it's, it's, it's not really recognized 
uh, it's actually not even an objective sometimes. So why do we need a food secure nutritional lens in social protection? I want you all of you to tell me what you think. Then should the nutritional status be an indicator of success of social protection programs? Uh, yes, no, and why? And then uh, let's say you have to choose one to three priorities. Let's say number one, just one, the priorities that you would have to achieve food security and nutrition in social protection uh, programming. What would they be? Uh, we've also got some interesting questions, uh, but let's try to cover these ones and please send, uh, send uh, to the audience uh, here and online. Feel free to send your, your questions via Twitter and if not possible via the chat box and we will be happy if we don't have enough time to, to share some uh, mini videos uh, via Twitter so we can try to cover all of those questions. So why do we need uh, a food secure and nutritional lens in social protection? Francisca. <laughs> okay, so I'm not sure we need that actually because I think social protection is not only about addressing food security and nutritional outcomes. So there are other issues that are also important uh, like with relation to human capital building and let's say the from protecting the people from falling into poverty and, and, and enabling their livelihoods. So for me this is not a given that we need a specific lens for that. But I can understand that maybe in some context in some countries it makes sense. So give me an example of that context for you. I don't know, that would be really in a very food deprived setting or during a crisis if we have famines and things like that. So there I see really that there might be very much an important issue to, to have a much stronger food security and nutritional lens, which could actually also um, influence the type of instruments that you design and utilize. Okay, um, Stephen, what do you think? And if you speak as, as loud as possible, um, why do we need a food secure nutritional lens in social protection? I think we definitely do, especially because in many low income and middle income countries, food insecurity and malnutrition remains a major development challenge. And not just inadequate food uh, intake or hunger, but also overweight and obesity increasingly, and also the ongoing problems of micronutrient deficiencies. If we don't pay attention to those uh, aspects of, of development or lack of development, then social protection won't achieve its maximum impact. And we know that without a specific focus on food security and malnutrition, you might not get that impact or without linkages to those other sectors that are needed to create those eight years that Michael mentioned. You've got to have those linkages built into social protection programs. You can't just assume you're going to get those impacts without that focus. Okay. Um, so, Michael, and as loud I, as possible. I agree entirely with Stephen. Why do we keep buying new models of smartphones? Every time a new model comes out, it has more lenses. We're waiting for model 13, 19 lenses on the back of the phone because we want social protection to achieve more. And in the words of Amit Khan, the CEO of the National Institute for the Transformation of India, stunting is everything. Across the African continent, across South and Southeast Asia, Policymakers want to achieve nutritional outcomes with the highest priority, with a much higher priority than they have for social protection itself. Enabling social protection to do its job better and help achieve nutritional outcomes is the best way to ensure social protection gets delivered and we get inclusive social development and equitable economic growth. Okay. So let's go to the second question. Uh, and I would like Stephen to, to, to start first. Should nutritional status be an indicator of success of social protection programs? Yes or no and why? I used to think yes, and now I think no. Okay, why is that? <laughs> why such change of heart? Well, why yes, because nutrition status is obviously one of the most fundamental indicators of development. And therefore, you would expect social protection, which is addressing the poorest of the poor, to achieve nutrition status, um, improved nutrition status. But the problem is, what if you run a social protection program that's very effective in terms of many outcomes, but doesn't reduce child malnutrition? 
there's a risk that you then assess the program as having failed. In fact, it's not always, in fact, hardly ever is it the fault of the social protection program, which is making some difference, but it's not necessarily enough on its own, because as we have seen, you need those linkages to other sectors. If you don't have clean water, good sanitation, um, breastfeeding, and so on, then you're going to not get the, the nutritional impacts that you need, but it's not the social protection program's fault. So we can't put too much onto social protection. It does its job, but only it only works well if it's linked to other sectors to achieve those nutritional outcomes. What do you think, Michael? Should nutritional status be an indicator of success? Absolutely. Nutrition is one of the most important outcomes we can generate. And yes, I agree, social protection programs often fail to enable this outcome adequately, but we must be more ambitious. We must demand more. We must demand that social protection do more than just deliver the right benefits to the right person at the right time in the right place. We know how to do that. It is the 22nd of October, 2019. All the easy things have been done already. Let's tackle the important and complex challenges. Let us recognize that it's a failure when we do not implement social protection systems within broader developmental systems that can achieve these vital outcomes like improving nutrition. Okay, and then finally, uh, what, uh, uh, what do you think, Francisca? Should nutritional status be an indicator of success? It depends. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> no, it depends. For me, it is always, I look at this rather structurally. So the question is, linking to the first question is, if nutritional outcomes is one of the objectives of social protection, then yes, it has to be looked at as a, whether it is a success or a failure or whatsoever, have we achieved it or not. But I also think it matters. So it matters on the objective. It could also vary per instrument. Yes. So whether we should have that. So for me, it's not really a yes or a no. Okay. So it depends. And yeah. finally, and we'll start with Michael. What is your number one priority to achieve food security and nutrition uh, through social protection? Recognizing that we have mostly failed around the world, around the developing world, and achieving the necessary nutritional impacts. The number one priority is to be more ambitious. And by that, I mean taking the risks we need to innovate the kinds of programs that can really succeed, which means we might fail at first, but let's fail quickly and learn from our failure and design the kinds of programs through a learning by doing approach that can ultimately achieve success. Okay, um, Stephen, what is your number one priority to achieve food secure nutrition from social protection? For me, it's about educating women and girls. There's evidence around the world that educated mothers are associated with a 40% reduction in child malnutrition. In South Africa, an evaluation of the child support grant found that there was no significant reduction in malnutrition across the full sample, but among households, children in households where the mothers had eight years of education or more, there was a significant reduction in malnutrition of, of their children. So formal education is very important, but informal education is also very important. And what we call behavior change communication, BCC, is very powerful. So a study in Bangladesh, for example, found that if you had cash transfers plus nutrition-related uh, BCC, which means uh, information about hand washing, about dietary diversity, about breastfeeding, then you got a 1% increase in child height. Stunting was reduced significantly by having the cash transfers plus BCC together, rather than just cash transfers on their own or food transfers on their own or cash plus food as a package. Great, but I have a question uh, related to that because we're kind of, you know, we're using a, a gender lens. And I see from Francisca that that was one of the elements that gender is not uh, addressed uh, as, nutrition, as a nutritional outcome either. And then Michael was saying that it was, was vital to society to have a gender lens. But we have a gender lens and we understand gender as relational, which is what my colleague Maya Gavrilovic would say. Uh, we're, we're, we're men. We're, we're posing the, the knowledge and the change of practices in women. Could we have a higher uh, 
impact and a better impact if we engage men in line with SDG 5.4, which is sharing the responsibilities, productive and reproductive a bit more equitably within the household? What do you think? Absolutely, that's true. The evidence that we've got so far focuses on women in their role as primary caregivers, but often social protection has been criticized for putting too much pressure on women, additional burdens. For example, we have conditional cash transfers. Women are the ones that have to make sure that kids go to schools and clinics. Um, so if we can inv involve men more in that and shift the balance within the household, then that would be a fantastic achievement. But social protection on its own is probably unlikely to change gender norms. We need to have a combined approach, which again would link social protection in the form of cash transfers and so on to those other interventions, empowering women and men. Okay. Uh what would be your number one priority to achieve food security and nutrition through social protection? Should that be the case? Should uh, that be necessary? I mean, my number one priority is to increase coverage and adequacy of existing programs, because I think in many countries, it's just these programs, it's somehow lip service. We do something, maybe we have even governments that they really have been pushed by it, donors to do something, but also in countries like Central Asia, where it's uh, that they are really institutionalized, you see that coverage is so limited, benefit values, you know, they, they, they stay so low, you can hardly do, they cannot be effective. So in a way, programs for the poor are poor programs, as Amartya Sen has, has said decades ago, and this hasn't changed. And this has to do with the attitudes towards the poor, that we have these prejudices, you know, they become welfare dependent, they are lazy, if we give them money, they will not do anything. And it's so difficult to get rid of this prepara to about these prejudices. But for me, I think increased coverage, make sure those people that need it are covered and make the transfer meaningful. Hmm. Interesting, thank you, Francisca, Michael and Stephen. Now, we have some very interesting questions from the audience. Uh, there is one uh, from, um, from uh, Matteo Caravani uh, to Stephen Deverot. So I'll say this one, uh, to which one do you have another question? And I'll give you another one, um, Michael. So the first to Stephen Deverot. In the analytical framework, uh, how Devereaux reconciles, analytical framework we were talking about, how do you reconcile the 1996 definition of food security by separating food security from nutrition? In his analytical framework, it seems that food security is just about food availability and food access dimensions. What happens to the utilization dimension, for instance? And I would add the stability as well. How can a country be classified as food secure with high levels of stunting? Does this call for a new definition of food security? So let's leave it there. Now, uh, from Winnie Sambo, we have a question for Francisca. What could be the reason for the lack of positive, significant effect of cash transfers in Kenya on food spending among households that are less poor compared to the poorest? Please refer to the graph on food expenditure that you were, you were talking. Now, this is very interesting. Uh, I will answer that one. That is from Tia Palermo, which is bringing a very interesting, a, a very interesting piece of evidence. And I will uh, answer that because that was something I was working in before, which is a word that you may not know, which is mycotoxins. She's talking uh, about some surprising new evidence suggests that we may be missing a key area for the plus components in Cash Plus, which we see that cash transfers are not sufficient, we often conclude that integrated social protection or cash plus examples, so, such as cash transfers with wash, water and sanitation, uh, may be a promising avenue for addressing stunting. However, recent SHINE trial evidence, uh, an RCT from Kenya, Zimbabwe and Bangladesh, show that wash did not improve stunting. Got this very interesting. Thank you, Tia, for sharing this with us. Researchers from this SHINE group have suggested that mycotoxins, toxic fungi in foods could be contributed to stunting and that these, exacerbate, uh, that these are exacerbated by food storage practice, such as storing maize on the ground, etc. Time for cash plus, where the plush is better uh, from food storage and processes practices. Um, see Smith et al., for example. 
Um, so she's saying basically it's time for Cash Plus to consider better storage and processing practices. Uh, okay, I have an answer for that one. And then um, uh, Michael from Moses Kumaron Ortega. He says, I completely agree with Michael on lack of complementarity being, uh, among social protection programs in Africa. Could this be one of the reasons why cash transfers in Nigeria have not been effective? And, and finally, for everybody, uh, I, would, I would bring a Rachel Valverde in which she's saying, thanks for the presentations. I wanted to ask a more practical operational questions on these interventions. Thanks for searching on some of the operational aspects of program implementation, like payment systems, etc. One of the biggest challenges to any nutrition-related program is how to influence thinking and behavior of people. And she, she's quite interesting. Uh, she poses a very interesting question because she doesn't only think about how on how on and the change of behaviors of households, but also in policymakers to invest. Because she says understanding the jargon itself is a challenge, normally technical or medical in this area of food security and nutrition sensitive. Uh, it becomes more daunting if we link nutrition to social protection. If we normally tie up these types of interventions with behavioral change and communication, BCC. But developing these communication tools is also not easy. Are there key, any key aspect of effective program implementation that is often overlooked and not invested in? So this is the whole question with all the great background she's giving us. So let's start with your question, Stephen, please, on the food security framework. Thank you, and <clears throat> thank you, Matteo. Nice to hear from you. I think that your question is very relevant and I have to agree with you that uh, in a sense what we've done here is we've played a bit with the definition of food security. So initially we focused very much on food security and it started out being a very productivist definition, in other words food availability or food production. Um, and then we started realizing that food security and nutrition security are not the same. So then we started talking about food security, um, food and nutrition security. And then we realized again that linking those two together is perhaps too much. So we then talked about food security and nutrition. Now, of course, these are closely linked. And in a sense, you could argue that the FAO conceptual framework for food security does incorporate nutrition because the four pillars are availability, access, stabilization, and utilization. And you could talk about nutrition as being the biological utilization of food. Um, so utiliza utilization is kind of covered there, that covers uh, the nutrition aspect. But I think what, what is helpful in the UNICEF conceptual framework is simply to, to separate out the food security part from the nutrition part, which is not directly related to food, in order to understand better that there are distinct pathways to malnutrition, some of which can be addressed through conventional food security interventions and others of which require complementary sectors. So it's really just trying to highlight and pick out the nuances between food security and nutrition security. Okay, great. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Francisca. Okay, if you look at that graph, the, the, the graph, the question was related to what explains, let's say, that the impact of the HSMP is actually um, much lower for households, for richer households. I must say this is, if you look at the graph, it is about, if you look at the, we have split the households into three groups based on their food expenditures per adult equivalent. So in the first year, tercile are households which spend very little on food expenditures and the third they spend the most and what you see is the hsmp program has a positive effect on food expenditure only actually a measurable effect impact on those households which have very low food expenditures to start with so in a way that also means that there is this safeguarding potential and it has to do with the benefit size in a way yes so that's also these are the most food constrained households and there you see the largest effect most probably in these other households food expenditures are at the level which is more or less efficient and you can utilize the cash for something else so but food as we discussed i'm sorry here in the training is also food is the most basic need we all have yes and if you are deprived of food and you will get additional money whatsoever, this is where you spend it first. And only after that, you can spend it on other things. Okay, 
Great. Uh, Michael, your question before? It's, it's a very interesting question. And I am not quite sure if you're talking about broadly developmental impacts of Nigeria's cash transfer programs or specific impacts on nutrition. Um, we've implemented a number of programs in Nigeria with the government um, in Sokoto State, in Niger State, and in others. And these have been evaluated very successfully for educational impacts. But we targeted school age girls. And that's later than the time period in which a cash transfer program will have maximal impact on nutrition. But there have been other programs that have focused on pregnant women and babies, and those have shown positive impacts. But there are several reasons why a cash transfer evaluation will show no or little impact. One is because the program itself does not work well. You're targeting pregnant women with complementary interventions, not just cash. You get the mix right, but for whatever reason, the program is failing. But more commonly, the programs are not adequately comprehensive, or they're not targeting the group for which the program will be most effective. We found in the CDGP program evaluation, a statistically significant reduction in the prevalence of stunting among children. But there's another important reason. Evaluations fail to find impact. And that's because they are poor evaluations. And that cannot be discounted. When you fail to find a statistically significant impact, it does not mean the program is not working. You generally do not have the statistical power to say that with anything greater than 20 or 25% confidence, which is well below the standard confidence we look for in robust studies. So look carefully and critically evaluate your program. When you reject the null hypothesis, you have your 95% or 99% confidence. But when you fail to reject the null hypothesis, you're limited to your statistical power which is much, much weaker and often poorly designed. Thank you so much for that one. And in relation to the, to the cash plus and the, and the very interesting question posed by Tia Palermo, we saw in Mexico um, that mycotoxins are a result, this fungi uh, that, that is developed in maize or grains, any types of grains because of bad storage uh, mainly um, are not just created because of storage, but also because of a bunch of other related agricultural practices. So it definitely it's linked to the plus side, and um, and it, it is particularly linked to the productivity side that we want to promote through cash transfers. And it's what our colleagues at, at FAO have been advocating as well, the transfer project that yes, social protection programs increase productivity, but cash plus are able not only to increase the productivity, but ensure the the, the food safety uh, of the products and, and ensure that the, even if the, the produce has been increased, um, that it can also be sold because of the of it maintains some standards. So uh, mycotoxin is completely related to those brutal advisory services that need to accompany, um, uh, uh, you know, social protection programs that have a productive component. And and for that, there's a lot of evidence being produced, particularly with pro campo, pro agro in Mexico, and where mycotoxins are a big issue. So with that, I want to thank everybody. We're two minutes uh, from finishing our webinar. We'll still have a great amount of, of, of people uh, watching. We want to tell you first that we will uh, record some videos and we'll get uh, an entire report between today and tomorrow, post them on Twitter. So stay tuned uh, to socialprotection.org um, website, their social media where we'll hope to get you know, all of these uh, questions retweeted. 
and we will also uh, will ask the audience to fill the survey to know, you know, how can we do better and, and deliver better uh, webinars in the future. Uh, we hope this will be the first of a series of them uh, hosted by the by socialprotection.org, but convened by the World Food Program on these and other critical issues. And uh, yes, uh, we're very thankful for your your audience, uh, your support, and your interest in this in this topic. Also, to our colleagues and and participants here. Uh, in Chiang Mai, and 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 thank you very much to the socialprotection.org team that has been uh, so supportive to this. Mariana Walboni in particular, Kareen and Aline, uh, we're very thankful, and of course to all our colleagues uh, watching us, we're very very thankful, and we hope this will be repeated, and for sure we'll answer all your questions, or we'll try to do so. Thank you very much, and 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 we hope to to have you again very soon in one uh, more webinar in the future. Thank you.